Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Sabah al Please take your seats. My name is Martin Indyk. I'm uh, the Executive Vice President of the Brookings Institution. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to chair this opening plenary session. I want to begin by thanking uh, Sheikh Mohammed Al Thani and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Qatar uh, for hosting this important forum. Uh, the subject this morning is security, national security, economic security, human security. Uh, and the reason is probably clear to all of us. There is a deep sense of insecurity that is spreading across the world. Uh, of course, it starts here in, in the Middle East where the collapse of order, uh, and the, the rise of terrorism of Al-Qaeda and Daesh and uh, the failure of some of the states in the region and governing institutions has created a deep sense of insecurity. But it spreads to North Africa, to Europe, even to my own country, the United States, uh, to Latin America, Brazil, Venezuela, we see the sense of insecurity uh, that permeates uh, much of the politics of our world today. We know its sources, the collapse of order, failure of state institutions, failures of governance, rise of terrorism, inequality, stagnation, dramatic drop in oil prices. The question really is what to do about it. And that's what I hope we'll have an opportunity to discuss this morning. We have uh, an amazingly diverse panel. Uh, what's particularly noticeable about it is that we have representatives here, high level officials, from Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Latin America, Europe, NATO, and the United Nations. Uh, we don't have uh, Middle Eastern speakers unless uh, we count NASA as Middle Eastern, but he's here in his UN hat. Uh, and I think that is an advantage of this panel. We are this morning looking, as it were, from the outside in. And I believe strongly that there is much that can be learned from that outside perspective. I've asked the speakers to uh, keep their opening remarks to uh, five minutes so that we'll have plenty of opportunity for conversation between them and between them and you, the audience. Let me start, first of all, by asking uh, His Excellency Morgan uh, Likatov, the president of the 70th century of the UN General Assembly, to begin. So, no, just... Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and good morning, Excellences, Honorable Ministers, ladies and gentlemen. Being here in the Middle East, uh, the theme of peace and security takes a great sense of urgency for the challenges facing this region, and truly immense they are. A protracted conflict in Syria, in Yemen, terrorist groups uh, bringing death and havoc across the uh, region, Palestinian Israeli conflict remains without any peaceful solution. Immense strains of, on the stability in Jordan and Lebanon, as well as in Turkey, by the incredible uh, flow of refugees, the humanitarian crisis connected with that. An escalation of tensions between regional powers, destructive sectarian divisions uh, that exacerbate a further violent extremism. And in addition to that, the destabilizing effect of climate, droughts, and land degradation, too many instances of where neither power nor prosperity are shared in a way that brings societies together. And many of these challenges, however, uh, are not unique to the Middle East, as it was highlighted at the high-level thematic debate of the General Assembly that I convened in New York only two weeks ago. At that meeting, member states were clear to address challenges in peace and security area, uh, and uh, there is no substitute 
A concluded, for political leadership and those countries and those groups most involved in current conflicts uh, must do more to bring an end to the suffering, the divisions, the tensions that are depriving millions of a better future. Member states were also clear, however, that the international community and the UN in, in particular can do much more. Member states are coming to terms in, with the fact that the architecture developed in the last seven decades to maintain international peace and security is struggling to keep pace with today's and tomorrow's threat and ge geopolitical tensions. In particular, the absence of adequate tools and capacity to protect civilians in conflict, to respond effectively to new forms of conflict, uh, complex conflicts, to address terrorism, as well as other challenges with a clear security dimension, such as large-scale epidemics and large displacement of population, has undermined the trust of the UN's ability to deliver on its mandate. In this context, and uh, it is crucial that member states recommit to the principles of the Charter, refrain from use force or threat, use of force, uh, and uphold their obligations under international humanitarian law. Last year, we joined hands uh, around the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement. And in the security sphere, we saw renewed cooperation finally between major powers on Iran and even on Syria. When multilateralism works, it can provide solutions and hope. Now, we must build on that spirit and go forward. In particular, we must take concrete action to address the shortcomings of the United Nations itself. A number of major reviews are currently looking in how the UN as a whole is performing in conducting peace operations, supporting peace building efforts, and enhancing the role of women in, in uh, peace and security, and in preventing extremism and countering global terrorism. Recommendations have emerged thus far very clear to respond to today's and tomorrow's threat. The United Nations must become more relevant, more credible, more legitimate, and more capable. Uh, for many, this includes making the UN Security Council, of course, more effective and more representative. I share that view. But it also includes the need for political solutions to inform every aspect of uh, UN's approach to sustaining peace to put prevention at the heart of, of the architecture and forging a consensus on crucial set of budgetary and institutional reforms to that effect. And to ensure that the UN works more seamlessly across these three pillars of peace and security, sustainable development and human rights, and engage in a more consistent uh, uh, with, with communities. To ensure that women are more involved, to identify concrete ways in which the UN can effectively co contribute to prevention, uh, respond to terrorism and violent extremism. And to bring a greater cooperation about between UN and regional organizations and to ensure that the UN special representatives uh, who lead peace efforts are at the highest integrity and diplomatic skills. Many of these changes require both institutional and structural changes in the UN, and it is clear that the next UN Secretary, Secretary General uh, will have to uh, uh, be appointed later this year, have a unique window of opportunity early in her or his term to put those changes in place. To do so, however, uh, it will be... Uh, needed a significant and sustained support from member states, and it is my hope that the discussions at forums like this can help to advance this discussion and secure broad buy-in for such changes. Because, ladies and gentlemen, in the end, our collective security depends not just on our individual actions, but on the capacity of the United Nations, as in the UN uh, Charter it stated, to unite our strengths to maintain international peace and security, to live together in peace with another as good neighbors. I thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, for 
a, a great uh, opening uh, with its focus on, on UN reform. Uh, we now have an opportunity from, for here, to hear from Susanna Malkora. Uh, she is uh, currently newly appointed as Minister of Foreign Affairs of Argentina and has just announced her candidacy for UN, the position of UN Secretary General. Uh, but for many years, she has worked as uh, Chief of Staff uh, to the UN Secretary General and has deep knowledge of the very things that uh, President uh, Likatov uh, just uh, referred to. So hopefully we'll be able to get into that discussion. Susanna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. Uh, President of the General Assembly, colleagues of the panel, uh, colleagues in the forum, friends, ladies and gentlemen, let me start uh, echoing what uh, Martin said at the beginning, a great appreciation to Sheikh Mohammed Al Thani who has uh, fostered this uh, forum and has allowed all of us to come together for this conversation. Uh, I'm here as the foreign minister of Argentina and with that perspective, I will try and convey the view from far away, deep south. Um, to think about peace, security, stability and prosperity for all is to think about a set of deeply related and independent concepts, values, practices and dynamics in which global and regional balance plays a fundamental role. Building up trust, promoting transparency and active diplomatic participation, reaching political consensus and creating conditions for the development and well-being of the peoples are essential pillars to make security a global public asset. Argentina is deeply committed to this common task, the aim of which is to build a better and safer world in the 21st century. We believe that existing and new challenges must be faced through an increase in dialogue and multilateral cooperation. We believe in the rule of international law and in the involvement of the international community based on the principle of non-indifference. As much as we believe in non-interference, we believe in non-indifference. In fact, in a globalized world, this involvement is essential to successfully combat the problems that affect us all. The 21st century brings to us a number of interconnected challenges. President Ashraf Ghani covered them in his remarks last evening. Most of these challenges are of asymmetric nature and respect no boundaries and no states. This requires a strong, soul-searching review on how to tackle them. Is the international architecture, as mentioned by uh, President Likitov, as established, able to do it? Is there enough trust among states to allow themselves to work together towards a shared goal in regional and global organizations? Is there enough of an understanding that the collective good brings more than what the sum of parts will ever bring? If so, only a stronger multilateralism at all levels, international, regional, and sub-regional, will help. We can refer to examples, and it was done already, in which this approach has achieved good results. Agenda 2030, adopted last year, is a vivid proof of it. So is the Paris Agreement. In both cases, we were able to overcome what seem as insurmountable divisions with the common interest in mind and with a clear understanding that no single player could address those challenges on its own. These new collective agendas have set the tone for a new way of working in the development area. And then why is it so difficult to have a similar approach in peace and security? I will dare say that fear, lack of trust, and undeclared interest embedded in different power schemes 
shadow the need to tackle the real issues. In fact, it is often the case that confrontations, both regional or global, are played through proxies, creating chaos in third places, foreign to the original sources, sometimes nearby, others very distant. In a way, it removes the crisis from the source, creating a distance that makes it seem easier to handle. It is in this context that I will propose going back to basics. As much as the Agenda 2030 and Climate Change Agreement are about the people and the planet, so are the multiple conf conflicts that we are facing. Hence, we only stand a chance to address conflicts if we start looking into what people require from their own eyes, not through ours. Humbleness in the search of solutions should be recognized. We must look into conflicts addressing people's issues, real issues. Allow me to illustrate my point with a, an example. I was in a refugee camp in Lebanon five days ago. I met with a group of women and we discussed for 45 minutes. We talked about their suffering, their needs, their aspirations. I asked, that, I asked them what is it that they needed to end their pain. They asked for only one thing, to go back to their villages, not even to their destroyed houses, just to their villages. They didn't care if the conditions will be as bad as the ones in the camp. As long as they were able to go back home and be in their land with their families, sending their children to their schools, reestablishing their basic social fabric of the past, they believe that they will live and feel better. Going back home. Their plea was very simple and desperate. Stop the bombing, establish an immediate and lasting ceasefire, talk, allow us back. If we were to listen to these women, the refugee crisis that has brought so much suffering and so much tension to many parts of the world, including a spike in xenophobic conduct, will be put into a different perspective. And we need not to only to listen, but to give them a chance to be actors in the solution. The power of women and youth in covering and in establishing new and lasting solutions is often wasted. I deeply believe the world needs to go back to the basics. Think about we, the peoples and focus on the solutions of their problems. In doing so, there is a, need, a clear need to integrate regional and universal perspectives. Neighbors can be the source of creative approaches to address the local problems. Bringing cookie cutter approaches from afar may only worsen the crisis. But it's also true that sometimes Neighbors can be the cause of the problem and need to be kept away from being part of the solution. Hence, a real dynamic dialogue between all possible players, interna international, regional, and sub-regional, should be central to a people's focus trouble solving. Latin America has been a region of peace for many years now. Colombia is solving the only lasting conflict at this very moment. This doesn't mean that we do not have our difference. We do. It means that we have found ways to discuss our differences through a toolbox that includes a combination of good offices, informal dialogue, mediation, arbitration, etc. And with the flexibility to adjust to the best possible combination to arrive to a successful result. Our region has gone through agonizing times of dictatorships and human rights abuses of all sorts. This taught us that we must maximize 
the use of all available instruments to avoid more pain to the people who lost their beloved ones, who lost their self-respect and their self-esteem. So in conclusion, I deeply believe that it's time for us collectively to go back to basics, not to look for prepackaged solutions, to listen to the ones who cry for help because in their cry, they often picture the solution and to give them the chance to participate in its implementation. That we are all humble enough to accept that the complexity of the issues at hand requires solutions that are built on shared ground among multiple actors and that in building those singular solutions, one will have to accept that some may have a role to play and others not in order to maximize the chances of success. Solutions that come with a combination of bottom-up and top-down perspectives. Solutions that will be owned and implemented by the people involved to ensure they get to the right place. I thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Foreign Minister Makora. Uh, next, we're going to hear from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Azerbaijan, His Excellency Elmar Mabedni Yarov. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to join my voice uh, for the words of thanks, uh, Mr. Minister. It's a great pleasure to be back in Doha uh, for this very interesting and very important uh, debates uh, within the Global Forum. I think that through the years of uh, existence, this Global Forum will start to be a very important and very interesting platform for exchange of views, in particular today's panel, which calls international regional status quo and the means to meet the challenges. I, uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, because I look around and probably my country and with a vision of uh, how we address uh, these challenges, how we're going to meet with these challenges, is the only one who is directly involved uh, into the uh, conflict resolution. So we're going to talk about right now about Colombian experience. Uh, we are very unfortunate uh, still after the, uh, of more than 25 years, uh, still uh, on, almost uh, on the stage of war with the neighboring Armenia, after the hot period of time uh, occupying about 20% of our territories with one million of refugees and IDPs. This is notorious uh, uh, issue of the uh, conflict and it's not a unique case in our case when we consider the Middle East developments and uh, what was said uh, globally. Uh, generally speaking, uh, through the perspective of what we said of Azerbaijan's point of view, uh, particularly in our part of the uh, world, I, I think that uh, I will agree with those who are uh, uh, thinking that uh, the uh, post-Cold War world is still under reconfiguration. And uh, if we just look inside of this, uh, that uh, well, the latest developments, uh, including in the wider Middle East or in my own region, we have uh, uh, recognized uh, that uh, the global order, which was established after the World War II and then with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and still do not find uh, its own place. And it's also, uh, we have to face, when we're talking about the challenges, we have to recognize that with the latest uh, uh, strong developments of informa information technologies, now we're facing not only traditional uh, challenges like uh, military aggression or illegal occupations, but unconventional challenges, uh, including all the cyber threat, uh, the strengths of terrorism, mass uh, migration, trafficking, and so on. And uh, in this case, we, I believe that uh, the uh, mix of the, or put in another way, erase of borders between the regional and uh, global security. Uh, now, whenever what's happened in one part of the world, it's uh, also affected the other part of uh, the world because it's uh, so much interconnected. And in this case, uh, of course, find out the way how to address it. I, I, I agree what's uh, said by uh, just before of me, uh, that one of the way is to strengthen the United Nations institution. It's extremely important, uh, strengthen of 
uh, United Nations Security Council, uh, because again, returning back to our case, uh, what, what we have put in mind of uh, the word strengthening, uh, it's implementation of its own resolution. In case of my country, there is in 1993 uh, adoption of uh, the uh, four UN Security Council resolution, which not calls but demand of withdrawal of Armenian troops from occupied territories. Unfortunately, it's still not implemented. Uh, in some cases, we also know, let's be honest, that some of the UN Security Council resolutions are starting implementing just uh, before the adoption of it by the full, uh, uh, by the full Security Council. So, in this case, I think that uh, what we need to do is looking, uh, of all of us, uh, how we can strengthen uh, the UN, uh, UN United Nations uh, system. Uh, my belief that uh, one of the uh, most important elements is strengthening norms and principles of international law, which was adopted as a result of the bloody uh, World War II, because uh, at that time uh, it's important for uh, for all member states of United Nations fully implement and fully uh, addict by the uh, international law because this is the way how we can at least uh, build up uh, the future uh, for the of, of our world uh, because I think that uh, that can that can create uh, what I would like to say predictability in the international uh, relations uh, and then uh, we uh, we can uh, besides of this uh, legal or political will, uh, two more elements which is absolutely important when we're talking about uh, how we meet the challenges of uh, today. Number one, of course, I've also joined with the previous speaker, it's economic development. I think that sustainable development and uh, encouraging of uh, assistance and aid uh, to the uh, and reforming uh, the economies, including of what was happened was what's facing by Europe with all this migration, because part of it migrate, uh, migration is touched with uh, the uh, military uh, effect, but the other uh, affected by military. But the others is of course economic hardship, and in this case, uh, development of the states uh, uh, supporting them in the, uh, different assistance and aid and encouraging of reforms. Uh, that will be creating uh, much more opportunities uh, for those uh, or, or who are right now looking to get out from the countries and, and creating the problems of uh, migration and so on. And uh, the second uh, uh, point which I also want to make uh, before I end uh, my thoughts, it's, uh, it's a fight for the minds of the people, which I believe that uh, this is a new phenomena of the 21st uh, century. Uh, when we're recognizing that through the uh, uh, information technology, we start to losing uh, the uh, minds of the people, including uh, uh, more and more its uh, the belief of the people into the injustice uh, which has existed in the world. And it's very dangerous when it believes that this injustice is based on religious factor. And uh, I think that uh, building up and more strengthening uh, with regard to the multiculturalism, strengthening of this Alliance of Civilization movement, by the way, it was extremely successful uh, last uh, seventh forum of Alliance uh, of Civilization. Nasser probably told more about it. Or uh, uh, addressing this issue uh, in open-minded, uh, recognizing uh, that uh, religion cannot be a part of or the threat uh, to the uh, uh, to the any uh, uh, to the any territorial disputes or any uh, the conflicts because that's uh, will take us to nowhere, and uh, I strongly believe the United Nations uh, must do more uh, from the point of bringing multiculturalism and uh, this uh, civilization uh, approach uh, uh, to the uh, again to the minds of the people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we're going to uh, hear from the Foreign Minister of Costa Rica, uh, His Excellency, Excellency Manuel Gonzalez Sanz, please, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank our host, the State of Qatar, His Majesty the Emir, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs for having us here. We're here to talk about security. Uh, I have more questions than answers about the matter, and uh, I would like to start by questioning ourselves what the concept really means. Is it about uh, 
weapons of mass destruction? Is it about terrorism? Is it about climate change? Is it about uh, food security? I think it's a, it's a mix of all of them. But if we don't agree that it's a mixture of topics, that the concept of security or insecurity is composed by many elements, we are not going to be able to make any progress. We need to realize that it's a very holistic concept in order to project every country into the concept. I'm sure that if we are asked among different groups what security means, we all will have a different answer because we'll reflect in that concept the, the problems that we face at the interior of each of our countries. That's okay, that uh, could be a right answer. But if we really want to move forward in terms of global approach to the matter of security, we have to realize that is a much broader uh, concept. How do we deal with matters related to the threats that we face in the, in the, in the security issue? I'm a great believer that cooperation is one of the key elements. And cooperation is not giving away to other countries. It's working together. If we don't realize the need of working together at a global scale, we are not going to make any progress either. We need to have real discussions at the multilateral level, but with practical results. We attend many meetings. We talk about very nice things. We put in writing our willingness to work together, but in practical terms, it is not happening. It's very frustrating for a lot of countries that make a great effort to attend meetings, to have missions, to have the negotiators participate in very long hours of discussions and end up with a nice wording, nice language that doesn't have any impact on real life. And here, I think that the Security Council has a great deal of responsibility. We take a lot of decisions there, sometimes. Key decisions are not even taken there. But in the end of the day, as my friend, the colleague, our colleague, the Minister of uh, Azerbaijan was mentioning, four resolutions by the Security Council that are just words. Nothing has happened during almost three decades. Is that really helping the world to become a safer place, to have more credibility in the system? Are regional and global organizations really delivering what they are supposed to do? I think that the answer is no. That is undermining the whole concept of security and living in the same planet. Everybody is pulling the string towards their own interest. There is a, a lot of selfishness in the world among countries that they don't want to cooperate, work together at a global scale. I come from a country that if we talk about um, uh, military expenditure, I come from a country that abolished the army, the armed forces, 68 years ago. 68 years ago. If you try to put yourself 68 years ago, it's very hard for me to do it because <laughs> I was not even born at that time. But if you put yourself in that context, what was the world living at that time? You will realize how bold that decision was. Have we been exempted from threats in our region, in Central America? No. We are facing, facing different threats, but the other threats existed at that time. There were conflicts, armed conflicts in Salvador, in Guatemala, in Nicaragua. Most of the countries in Latin America were dictatorships, and we took that decision and decided to invest on human development. 
basically on health and education. And that has paid off. We are a small country, 50,000 square kilometers, 5 million people, and what we can offer the world today is human talent. We cannot compete with other countries in volume. We offer human talent. What I'm trying to say here is that at least there is one case, the first country in the world that took that decision, that can talk with moral authority about disarmament, a government that has a country that has a stand out and has proven that it is possible to develop or to have certain levels of development without incurring in high levels of military expenditure. I'm not saying or not realizing the difficulties that other parts of the world are facing. I'm not saying that all the armies should be eliminated. But we really have to start committing ourselves, at least on the matter of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. There's a, there are about 16,000 warheads. We can destroy the planet several times with that. Why do we, do, do we need that? Can anybody really, really think about using them? And what, the, the, the big threat there is what about cyber, cyber attacks? Who's holding these arms? If we, do, if we reach a real commitment, a transparent one, verifiable in regards to weapons of mass destruction, in particular to nuclear weapons, we'll be able to lower the military expenditure and really cooperate among each other. There will be plenty of funds available for many countries to use them for their own development. Again, I'm not saying about giving away. A way of cooperation is investing in other countries, helping the students to attend the best universities in the world, giving scholarships, having cultural mixtures. That's the kind of, of new ways of cooperation that we should be aiming for. The middle-income Trump, it's one of the, of the things that is affecting a lot of parts uh, in the world. My country is part of that, uh, of that dilemma. We are considered a middle-income country, so we are excluded from most cooperation. Nevertheless, we are willing to give cooperation. We are willing to share our experiences with other parts, with other countries in the world. And we have li limited resources, but we are willing to do it. Are other parts of the world willing to do that as well? Again, I think that the answer is that there is a lot of selfishness. We have to work on a collective matter. We have to strengthen multilateralism, multilateralism as a way to really strengthen our discussion about security matters. Uh, you're gonna the have key, to the, just uh, wrap to wrap up, up the, final, the final idea that I wanted to address is that the essential, the key element is peace. There is no way to develop if there is no peace. And peace should be considered and discussed as a as a global public good, global public good. That's the key element from our perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Singapore is a country, as a uh, city state that lives in a uh, strategic environment, some, somewhat like Qatar, understands very well the issue of security and insecurity. So it's my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Mohammed Maliki bin Usman. Uh, to speak next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, a very good morning. It's really an honor for me to be here. Uh, I thank the State of Qatar for the kind invitation to this 16th Doha Forum uh, for its gracious hospitality. The theme for this year's forum, Stability and Prosperity for All, is indeed very apt. I am not an expert in the Middle East, uh, but I will share with you our experience and our perspective on how we, can, how we see security situation in the Middle East and its impact on Southeast Asia. We are worried about the challenging 
security situation in this region, especially in Syria, Yemen, Libya and Iraq. We need to resolve these conflicts urgently as terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State IS have exploited the security vacuum and the collapse of social order to establish a reign of violence, oppression and fear. The expensive network of terrorist groups have deeply impacted Southeast Asia. IS's global reach has surpassed that of Al-Qaeda. It has recruited more than 36,000 foreigners, including at least 1,000 nationals from Malaysia, Indonesia and the Philippines, and a few from Singapore. IS has even set up a battalion for Southeast Asian fighters called the Katiba Nusantara Lidaulia Islamia, or the Malay Archipelago Unit for the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Terrorism is not new to Southeast Asia. The Al-Qaeda-linked Jamaa Islamiyah, or JI, was formed in the 1990s with the intention of setting up the Daulah Islamiyah, or Islamic State, through violent means. JI was responsible for several bombings in Indonesia in the mid-2000s and even planned to bomb specific targets in Singapore, but their plans were thwarted with the arrest of 13 members of the GI in December 2001. But our biggest concern is that IS has even larger ambitions and more resources. IS has exploited the existing ter terrorist networks and declared its intention to set up a wilaya or province in Southeast Asia. It has sought to recruit Southeast Asians through slick media productions, including mobile video games, that appeal to the restless and radicalized individuals, particularly the youth. Southeast Asia is fertile ground for IS. Many people move to our region for work and leisure. Singapore has to be alert against the radicalization of our migrant population as well. In April this year, we arrested eight Bangladeshi nationals and months earlier deported 27 other Bangladeshi nationals for terrorism-related activities. The global brand name of IS is attractive to homegrown self-radicalized individuals and regional militant groups seeking to gain attention for themselves even when they have no direct linkages to IS or understand their cause. Militant groups, and many of whom are small in their respective countries, feel that they are backing quote-unquote a winner. or This increases their prestige and sense of importance through IS. A study showed that 26 militant groups in Indonesia, 9 in the Philippines and 5 in Malaysia have either pledged allegiance to IS or declared support for it. In 2014, radical Indonesian cleric Abu Bakar Bashir very publicly pledged allegiance to IS from prison where he is serving a sentence for terrorism offences. These have contributed to the perception of a growing IS presence in the region and could encourage even more to join their ranks. There are also concerns that existing terror links between may have expanded beyond our region. There are indications that Uyghurs from China could be travelling to Southeast Asia to join regional terrorist groups. In July 2015, four Chinese Uyghurs were sentenced by Indonesian courts for allegedly trying to meet Santoso, a leader of the Mujahideen Indonesian Timor, which has pledged its allegiance to IS. Indonesian security forces also killed two Chinese Uyghurs who had joined Santoso in Sulawesi in March 2016. Malaysia has also successfully foiled several IS plots and arrested at least 170 individuals for suspected extremist activities, including some with links to the Malaysian military and police. IS has also declared its intention to carry out revenge attacks on governments which have cracked down on its members. As recent as a few days ago, IS released a video declaring Malaysia as Tagut and announced plans to lead a charge against Malaysia. Southeast Asia saw its first IS-linked terrorist attack in Jakarta in January this year. Indeed, IS fighters returning from the conflicts in the Middle East are a threat to our society given their experience and networks that they have established there. We need a concerted response and indeed a necessary concerted response. There are no easy solutions to countering terrorism. Cooperation between countries is critical in three areas. First, security agencies should work closely to exchange information on terror networks. Singapore has stepped up cooperation with Malaysia and Indonesia and partners outside the region such as Australia and the US. In November 2015, we denied 
entry to two Indonesians who claimed to be tourists, but later admitted that they were going to Syria to join IS. Both were deported to Indonesia. Second, cooperation in the multinational coalition against the IS. Singapore was the first Southeast Asian country to contribute military assets to the coalition. This included an intelligence planner and an imagery analysis team to the combined joint task force in Kuwait uh, and a KC-135 tanker which refilled 142 coalition aircraft in 52 sorties during last year's operations. With the strong support of the Qatari government, Singapore is presently deploying the second KC-135R attachment, detachment. We are grateful to other partners in the region such as Bahrain, UAE, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia for overflight and landing clearances. This is a tangible example of the importance of and benefits of close cooperation. Third, we need to counter the extremist ideology that fuels the militants' resonant. There is an urgent need to develop a counter-narrative to extremist propaganda. Religious teachers and institutions bear the heavy responsibility of teaching the right theology. We thus welcome the open letter to Al-Baghdadi of September 2014, signed by many prominent clerics, Islamic scholars and theologians, which expose the fallacies of the IS theology. This open letter must reach out to more Muslims in the digestible bits that will enable them to understand the true message and reject the extreme views of Islam propagated by IS. At the national level, there is no room for complacency. The best form of prevention is to build a resilient society where all its members feel a sense of belonging. This is why, since independence in 1965, Singapore has worked tirelessly to build a harmonious multiracial, multicultural, and multi religious society and to prevent the formation of racial and religious enclaves, marginalization, and discrimination. We actively manage our public spaces so that all religions and races can coexist and interact at an, on an equal footing. A comprehensive network of grassroots, community self help groups, interreligious and government organizations, and initiatives have helped to foster national identity and mutual tolerance and respect. We also need to monitor closely the use of the internet and social media to spread extremist propaganda and untruths. We must prevent divisive views from proliferating, especially over social media. Singaporeans are aware of the need to air their views in a sensitive and responsible way and would speak out against divisive messages and untruths. To counter false ideologies and teachings, the Muslim community in Singapore established a religious rehabilitation group which raises awareness within the community through pamphlets and videos. This group has also provided religious counselling to radicalised individuals and we are encouraged that the rate of recidivism has been low. At the international level, Singapore hosts the annual Shangri-La Dialogue, or SLD, the preeminent regional security forum to enhance dialogue and exchange views amongst countries. Besides pressing regional security issues such as the South China Sea, this year's SLD will also be discussing defence policy making and enhanced cooperation against terrorism in Asia. Looking ahead, terrorism is just one of the many types of security threats we, fa what we all face today. The challenges are complex and, we do not, and do not fit easily into our traditional security paradigm. It is not possible to win this fight alone. As our Arab friends will say, Fi il tihad kuwa, or in unity there is strength. There are many proven examples of how the international community has worked well together. For example, the multinational counter piracy task force in the Gulf of Aden, which is headquartered in Bahrain, has successfully reduced piracy attacks. Singapore is honoured to command the combined task force for the fourth time. Similarly, we stand committed to work with our friends in the Middle East to build a stable and prosperous world for all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, my old friend Nasser bin Abdulaziz Al Nasser has a special uh, role today. He is the UN representative for the Alliance of Civilizations, and I would ask him to give us uh, this perspective from that point of view, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Martin. Good morning. At the outset, I would like to say I am very honored to be addressing this important forum in my international capacity 
in my hometown, Doha. In this regard, I would like to thank His Excellency, the Foreign Minister, for his kind invitation. When we think about the security status quo in our world today, violent extremism, terrorist attacks, and radicalization comes as startling reminders of the serious threat they pose to the international peace and security, as well as the widening gap, lack of understanding, and fear within and among societies, as well between nations. Extremist and terrorist groups are disguised behind religion to incite hatred and discord within all societies. In this criminality, these groups challenge the values enshrined, enshrined in the United Nations Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What should we do as international community? And how does the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations contribute to this effort? As the high-level group defined our purpose 10 years ago, the Alliance is the soft power tool established to contribute to a more peaceful world by countering radicalization and polarization, by encouraging greater intercultural understanding and engaging in projects and programs that advance these goals. This past month, the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations organized its seven global forum in Baku, Azerbaijan. And the main themes was living together in inclusive societies, a challenge and a goal. Participants coming from all walks of life agreed that sustainable development cannot be realized without peace and security. At the same time, peace and security will be at risk without sustainable development. Inclusive societies provide avenues for political, social, and economic inclusion. They guarantee social and human rights, access to opportunities and employment. By doing these things, they reduce the risk of violent extremism and terrorism. Rising disparities of wealth and opportunities within societies lead to marginalization and exclusion, gender inequality, unemployment, and particularly youth unemployment, fuel radicalization, and push people towards violent extremism. Many years of experience have proven that heavy-handed approaches and a single-minded focus only on security measures have failed. We know that extremism and terrorism flourish when human rights are violated and aspirations for inclusion ignored. We must pay particular attention to addressing the causes or drivers of violent ex extremism, and we are prepared to do our part. To do so effectively requires a genuine partnership between the international community, civil society, religious leaders, and international and regional organizations. As the United Nations Secretary General put it, we should have a one UN approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nasser. Uh, before I call on uh, Ambassador Stamatopoulos, the NATO Assistant Secretary General, I want to give the other panelists a warning of a question that I'm going to uh, 
ask them after Terry has spoken, which is um, I listened carefully in, uh, to the different approaches, uh, UN reform, back to basics, focus on the minds of the people, promote multilateralism, uh, anti-terrorist cooperation, anti-radicalization measures. All of these are, are uh, very coherent and logical approaches to deal with the challenge of, of security. Uh, but nobody mentioned the United States, Russia, or China. And so uh, presumably they have some important roles to play. And so my question will be to any one of you or all of you that wish to answer it is if you had President Obama and President Xi Jinping and President Putin sitting here in front of you, what is it that you would ask one or all of them uh, to do? But while you think about that, let's hear finally from Ambassador Stamatopoulos, the NATO Assistant Secretary General. Please, Terry. Thank you, uh, Martin, uh, excellen Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am very honored uh, to be uh, here in uh, Doha. It's not working? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm very honored to be here in Doha today and to address uh, such a distinguished uh, international audience. My thanks to Qatar for the invitation and for continuing this very active uh, high-level political meetings that they have been organizing at least since the beginning of their partnership with uh, NATO that we are aware of. Uh, one cannot uh, deny that globalization uh, brings with it significant opportunities but also great challenges with implications that we still do not fully comprehend. I do believe that ultimately new governance solutions uh, will be required for this uh, globalized world, as now states on their own have significantly less of an ability to exercise control. Whereas in today's interconnected and globalized world, security challenges and threats have also become more globalized. This makes it imperative for states and international organizations to cooperate more closely and more effectively together. NATO is doing this through enhanced cooperation with its partner countries and with international organizations, to note the United Nations, the European Union, but also others. In this context, NATO and its Gulf partners had the foresight to launch 12 years ago the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative, the ICI. The, this initiative continues to show its relevance today in light of our short, shared strategic interest in the security and stability of the broader Middle East region. And because NATO and its Gulf partners face common transnational security challenges and threats, international terrorism, spillover from failing and failed states, the trafficking of small arms and light weapons, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and their delivery means, maritime security, the protection of sea lanes of communication and energy supply routes, especially choke points. The ICI aims to contribute to long-term global and regional security by offering countries in the Gulf and in the broader Middle East region a partnership to improve their capabilities to address common challenges and threats together with NATO. This partnership includes contributing to NATO-led crisis management operations, fight against terrorism, stemming the flow of WMD materials and illegal trafficking in arms, providing tailored advice on defense reform and civil-military relations, participation in training courses and exercises. So we are trying not only to address the what, but also the how. The, transition, the transnational spread of radical ideologies in terrorist organizations, such as ISIL, Daesh, represents a major threat to security and stability in the broader Middle East and beyond. So does com conflict spillover from Iraq and Syria, which is now reaching other conflict areas 
in North Africa as testified by the spread of Daesh in Libya. NATO is doing its part. We are working to enhance cooperation with our partners of 20 years in the Middle East and North Africa through our Mediterranean Dialogue Partnership to help them modernize their defense establishments and military forces so that they can effectively manage the security challenges and threats that they face. NATO has also launched a new defense capacity building initiative for countries requiring special and focused assistance, such as Iraq, which we are helping by providing training to its military officers in Jordan in several critical areas. I'll just uh, name counter-improvised explosive devices and ordnance disposal, civil military planning support to operations, cyber defense, security sector reform, and military medicine and medical assistance. Now coming back to the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative with our Gulf partners, let me highlight some of the progress that we have made. First, we have reinforced our bilateral and multilateral political dialogue to enhance regional understanding and situational awareness. Deeper engagement and dialogue with ICI invited countries such as Saudi Arabia and Oman as well as the Gulf Cooperation Council will also be of utmost value. Second, we have made significant progress in our practical cooperation in a number of areas, to name but a few, energy security focusing on the protection of critical energy infrastructure, proliferation of WMDs and their means of delivery, cyber defense, and we have also stepped up cooperation in the maritime domain with ICI countries in particular in the context of NATO's counter-piracy uh, involvement in the Indian Ocean. But I believe there is room to do more on the practical side, and we all should be more ambitious. To this end, I would like to highlight the development of the individual cooperation and partnership programs, we call them IPCPs, tailored to specific security needs of our Gulf partners. Uh, Kuwait was the first country to develop an IPCP back in 2014. We hope to finalize such tailor-made programs as well with Qatar, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates in the next five weeks. And the NATO ICI Regional Center that Kuwait has very generously offered to establish uh, will help us better implement these individualized programs and other activities allowing for NATO cooperation with Gulf states to grow. Third, we have seen a growing interest and ability of our ICI partners to project stability in their region and beyond. ICI partners have been key contributors to NATO-led crisis management operations, including in Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and in Libya. The resulting uh, level of uh, interoperability will be key in responding to international military crises that we could be called upon to manage together in the future again to restore peace. Finally, I mentioned earlier the increased need for cooperation between international organizations in addressing today's challenges and threats. To this end, I believe the time is ripe to establish regular working level ties between NATO and the Gulf Cooperation Council in light of the international role that the GCC has progressively assumed. For example, in regional crises such as Libya, Syria, and Yemen. We could start by establishing increased information exchange between the secretariats of the two organizations to provide a better mutual understanding of NATO's and GCC's functioning and policies, developing regular political dialogue, Practical cooperation could follow, for instance, to help the GCC build an integrated military structure, especially given GCC efforts to enhance defense integration through a joint military command, and especially the decision to step up efforts to form a joint maritime security force, which was taken March 2015 by the GCC. For more than six decades, 
NATO has had an integrated military structure working under the civilian oversight of its decision-making political body, the North Atlantic Council. If we could put this experience and expertise at the disposal of the GCC, if it so wishes. Ladies and gentlemen, through our cooperation with our partners in the Middle East and North Africa, NATO has been able to build a new culture of cooperation in the security sphere with 12 countries in this region for now. Today's common security challenges and threats affecting NATO and its partners in the Gulf region are very difficult to face alone. A multilateral and cooperative approach to security based upon enhanced political dialogue and practical cooperation offers the most effective way to tackle these challenges and threats in today's globalized security environment. Uh, this is the approach proposed by NATO to our partners in the Gulf region, and I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Stamatopoulos. Uh, we're going to come to you, the audience, uh, momentarily uh, to take your questions. We have about 20, 25 minutes uh, for that, but uh, before we do that, while you think about your questions, I wanted to uh, put the, my question uh, to whoever wants to answer it. You all represent uh, small or, uh, or uh, middle powers and uh, international organizations, um, but there are larger powers out there that can have a considerable impact uh, on the uh, security situation and, and uh, also the ideas that you've all put forward here. So what is it that you would want President Obama or President Xi Jinping or President Putin uh, to do that would make a real difference? Yes, please. I think we, I would add two more people to that group. No, you I can't like add two more the, people. Huh? Just three is enough. <laughs> no, no. I would like to have the... P5 there, and I will start with a suggestion, very brief. Give up the permanent seat and be to power. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Martin. Um, it would be great to have the three of them sitting here. And, and, and maybe just a brief, Next year. <laughs> a brief reading of, of, of the situation across the world. There is more and more disenfranchising of people in politics. Very, very dangerous trend. There is a more and more atomization of political power within countries. We see it happening in Europe, in Latin America, all over the world. Very, very a, a, a distributed power sharing. A, the interconnectedness of the issues that we all talk about, while people in the countries are becoming more driven by fear and geared towards closing, closing, and closing. Uh, the asymmetric nature of the threats, we talk about all of that. And all these issues are coming back to bite us um, in different ways, through elections, through you know, uprisings, through different ways of, of, of signaling. Uh, dynamics of social media and, and mass media play a role here into the politics, into the internal politics of, of each country in the world, while somehow we all read this through a zero-sum game approach. If that is to be the case, we're going into the wrong direction. So if, if I were to have the three leaders here, I will say, let's move from rhetoric to action, and let's move from a, an escalation process, very driven by security perspectives, to a de-escalation that is driven by the politics that have an impact on the people, and a way to grow the pie for all instead of thinking about zero-sum games. Thank you. President uh, Likatov. Well, if I had the three leaders here, I would say now we need you to draw the full consequences of that the communality of interests are much, much stronger than the diversity. All the existential problems we're facing, from climate change to counterterrorism, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction are common threats. We have to deal with them in common. The United Nations will never be stronger than the membership allows it to be. 
and the Security Council will never be stronger than what you allow them to be. We have seen with the Sustainable Development Goals and Climate, the common uh, community of interest prevailing. Finally, with great leaps forward, we saw on the Iranian nuclear issue that finally the five in the Security Council came together to avoiding yet another war in the greater Middle East region uh, about the risk of non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Now we have terrorism, we have the risk of proliferation to non-state actors, which is even more uh, dangerous than state proliferation. You need to join forces and use the United Nations as the structure in which you can uh, bring forward these common interests instead of quarreling of much minor diversity in interests for the common interest of humanity. Thank you. Pres uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mamadier. Yes. yes, as a following up, uh, first of all, of course, it's an excellent question. Uh, one extraordinary person once said that I have a dream. It was Martin Luther King who said I have a dream to have also three presidents in the hall. <laughs> but uh, following Martin Luther King's great word, uh, which I will probably repeat what he said, uh, that uh, injustice anywhere is uh, the threat to justice everywhere. And I think that uh, this is the best message which can be sent to three of them, that the rule of law is much more important than the rule of force. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Anybody else? Terry. Thank you, Martin, and cognizant of the implicit arrogance in telling three presidents what they should be doing. Let me say, first of all, that I totally agree with what President Linketov said. Just adding to that, that I think they should be uh, more visionary, uh, uh, behooving the stat status uh, real or perceived of great powers. Uh, and uh, to say that going back to 19th century type spheres of influence, power politics, and use of force is not the way ahead. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to your questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone, identify yourselves to us, and please ask a question rather than give a speech. Down the back there, please. We get a microphone over there. Thank you, Ambassador Indik. Good to see you again. Uh, my name is Saad Al Ajmi. I am from Kuwait University in Kuwait. My question, or a comment in a form of a query, rather, is... Just make sure it has a question mark it, at the it end is, of it, please. It is. <laughs> why isn't the, as an educator, why isn't the issue of education addressed when security is dealt with? Why isn't the educational curricula addressed when security is um, discussed? Only the gung-ho thinking and military preparations rather than talking to world leaders to bring about some sort of a common ground of humanitarian, advocating humanitarian ideals for peace, for international peace. Uh, I think it's one of the problems that we suffer from here is the educational curricula in general that actually creates a generation after a generation of schizophrenics. And I'm probably exaggerating by the use of the word schizophrenia here, but the problem of you know, trying to teach the young generation natural sciences, whereas we are actually implanting in them a metaphysical thinking for understanding the world and for their relationship with the others. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a couple more questions before we go back to the panel. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Let's wait for the microphone over here. Please stand up. I'm, I'm Professor Augustine Conner, former professor at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, now Director General of the Foreign Service Institute, 
um, in the Republic of Liberia. Uh, listening to the panelists, uh, first I want to thank um, the um, organizers and the Emir and the Foreign Minister for inviting us here. Listening to the panelists and the moderator introducing the panelists and um, one of the panelists, I think the Minister of Foreign Affairs of um, Argentina um, that talks about peace and security for all. My question is, if there's going to be peace and security for all, and listening to the introduction of the panelists, I find out that, that there's a missing link or a misrepresentation, and that misrepresentation is Africa. So the question is, if we're going to have peace and security for all, can there be peace and security for all without the representation of Africa and Africans who should come and talk about their own experience and challenges that they do have. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yes, sir, in the front here. In the front, please. Over here. <coughs> no, here. The man is standing up. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. Uh, أود أن أشكر دولة القطر وأميرها في هذا المنتدى الناجح وأود قبل أن أطرح السؤال إلى المتداخلين أن أقدم مساهمتي حول ما السياسة التي تبناها رئيس دولتنا السنغال وأولا أنا أعرف بنفسي اسمي سيدو جوف بروفيسور في جامعة شيك أنت جوب في دكار في كلية الحقوق أنا أساس في القانون ومساهمتي تدور حول ما السياسة التي تبناها رئيس ماكي سال رئيس دولتنا وهذه سياسة التي تهدف إلى مكافحة الإرهاب وتطرف ترتكز أساسا إلى تأسيس إطار وطني لمكافحة تحديات الإرهابية وهذا الإطار سمي عندنا بخلية السهر ستادير إن سيلول دو فيا وهذه الخلية مجهزة برقم هاتفي مفتوح لجامع المواطنين كل مواطن سنغالي أو غير السنغالي يعيش في بلدنا يلاحظ ما يريبه في شخص مجهول أو مشتبه به يمكن له أن يتصل بهذه الخلية عبر التليفون ليخبرها مع ما رأى ورئيس دولتنا يتبنى سياسة تهدف أساسا إلى مكافحة الفقر والبطالة وتطرف الديني لأنه يرى أن المسلمين هم أول من يتضرر من هذه التحديات وسياستنا أيضا تهدف إلى وقاية المسلمين أنفسهم من تطرف الديني فسنغال بلدنا تقع في غرب إفريقيا ولم يحدث فيها إلى حد الآن والحمد لله في ذلك أي هجوم إرهابي على خلاف ما حدث عند جيراننا مثل ماليا وساحل العاج وبوكينا فاسو وهذا لم يحدث عندنا وسر في ذلك فيما أرى أننا ندين لدين إسلامي حنيف والإسلام في السنغال أيضا يتصف بالوسطية بالوسطية وتسامح وحسن المعايشة والجوار بين بين الجامعة. والسؤال والسؤال الآن هو ما هي الإجراءات التي تم اتخاذها إلى حد الآن على صعيد دولي أو بصفة عامة أو على مستوى الدول العربية الشقيقة الصديقة لمساعدتنا في مكافحة الإرهاب في غرب أفريقيا. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. 
Thank you. So I asked the gentleman standing here, could you get him a microphone, please? I speak in Arabic. I am speaking here in the name of the five the مجموعة الساحل هي مجموعة شكلت في واكشوب هم أطرح بعد ذلك سؤال هنالك مسار سمي بمسار واكشوب وكان مسارا يعني حديثا حيث اعتمد مقاربة الأمن جدلية العلاقة بين الأمن والتنمية لا تنمية بدون أمن ولا أمن بدون تنمية وقد اعتمدنا مجموعة الساحل كما تعلمون أو تحديدا جغرافيا نحن نفهمها على أن المنطقة الممتدة من البحر من المحيط الأطلسي إلى البحر الأحمر يعني من موريتانيا تقريبا إلى ضفاف البحر الأحمر واعتمدنا في هذا المجال مقاربة من ثلاث نقاط أولا تفكيك وهذا مهم بالنسبة لي تفكيك البنية الفكرية الحاضنة لتكفير يعني أولا ب خلق حوار فكري حول هذا حول هذا المرجع الذي أصبح اليوم يمد الإرهاب بمعطيات إيديولوجية تمكنه من ما يقوم به من دماء وفي موريتانيا حصلنا على نتائج لا بأس بها في هذا المجال حيث أنشأنا حوارا مع الناس في السجون وشباب نغرر بهم وقد أعطانا نتائج جيدة حيث عاد أكثر من ثمانين في المئة من الناس في السجون عادوا وتم دمجهم في الحياة النشطة ولم يعود منهم إلى الإرهاب سوى شخصين منظمين حوالي ثمانين شخص ثانيا دمج الطبقات الهشة من خلال أيضا المقاربة الاقتصادية في الدورة الاقتصادية بخلق نشاط مدير للدخل ودمج الشباب لأن لاحظنا أن الإرهاب يستهدف أساسا الطبقات الهشة من المجتمع وطبعاً ثالثاً وهو المقاربة الأمنية التي تعتمد موريتانيا بلد يعني شاطر مالي حوالي ثلاثة آلاف كيلومتر وهذه الدولة تعرف نشاط إرهابي متجذر تعرفونه جميعاً والسؤال الذي كنت أود أن أطرحه هو يتعلق بمنطقة الساحل التي أعتبر أنها هي المنطقة الأكثر خطرا اليوم أو تمثل أكبر خطر إرهابي إذا تكلمنا عن ليبيا وإذا تكلمنا عن عدة مناطق أخرى وإلى امتداد هذا الإرهاب من خلال بوكو حرام إلى نيجيريا وإلى عدة مناطق أخرى لماذا لم تطرح أيضا هذه القضية من جهة نظرا لقربها من أوروبا وقربها كذلك من وسع وامتدادها نحو الشرق الوسط هذه المنطقة أعتبر أنها اليوم تشكل بؤراء أساسية من المهم التطرق إلى هذا المجال وشكرا Okay uh, We are out of time unfortunately so I'll just ask uh, any of the panelists who wish to address any of the questions in particular uh, the first one on the role of education uh, but if anybody has any comments on some of the interventions that were subsequently made about measures to counter terrorism and violent extremism. Uh, President Lutenkov. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. I, I'm, I'm sorry I had to leave in very few minutes to go to Istanbul. So let, uh, allow me just three very brief comments to what have been said. First, the intervention about the need of having common curricula in education about the need for international cooperation and understanding. I think that's very, very essential, and we have to work on that, and we have to work on all understanding what some of the other uh, interventions mentioned, that there is a clear interlinkage between the development agenda, the peace and security agenda, and the human rights agenda. Particularly, you could underline the fact that extreme poverty, we are bound to we have uh, committed to eradicate extreme poverty in the next 15 years. That will not be possible without peace.
because an increasing part of extreme poverty in this world is among the 120 million people uh, affected by conflicts and natural disasters. Third point, you cannot make uh, a global peace agenda without really integrating the, the uh, conflicts in Africa. Well, that was the third uh, intervention I wanted to uh, give a brief, uh, brief comment on. That was very much the center of the discussion at the high-level event we had in New York about peace and security and the United Nations tools in this field uh, last week. That we have to integrate much stronger the regional and sub-regional organizations, in particular in Africa, in our combined effort of peace building and peacekeeping. Uh, these were the, the very short comments I had. Thank, Thank you. you, and uh, safe travels if you Thank you. Uh, need to leave now. Uh, anybody else want to comment, uh, Susanna? Thank you, Martin, and again, being brief, and good trip, uh, BGA. Um, on education, couldn't agree more. Um, it's one of our shared values, education, so to include the basic messaging of a shared world is central. On, on the question coming from Africa, uh, I, I didn't mean to misrepresent, uh, for the ones who know me, know that the, should know how closely I've worked with Africa in all the configurations of setting up um, solutions for Africa, within Africa, with the African Union and the sub-regional organizations. In fact, that was the intention when I was talking about regional and sub-regional. I think um, uh, when, when we talk about uh, people-driven solutions, it's clear that in the case of Africa, it should be Africans dri driving their own solutions. And this is not only a question of, of dialogue, a question of being at the table, it's also a question of resources, which has been historically one of the missing links in, in, the, in, the, in addressing the problems in, in Africa and how to to finance some of the activities in, in, in the larger scheme. So I think that is part of, of, of the discussion that needs to, to take a, a place. One brief comment on the Mauritanian point about the coastal area and, and how it is important to talk about this. Let me give you an example of interconnectedness. Argentina has become the third exporter of cocaine in the world. We do not produce cocaine. We are just in the supply chain. We are in the added value of the supply chain. We are seeking to add value, but we didn't intend to do it in this supply chain. But there we are. The cocaine leaving Argentina that comes from farther north and is being pushed to the south goes to Europe. And it goes to Europe through Western Africa. And it feeds and finances the Boko Harams, the Akims, the other extreme groups in that part of the world. So here we are in Latin America, seemingly foreign to the discussion of extremism and financing violent extremism, but we are central to part of this financing. So clearly, we all need to look at these issues and to in the interconnectedness of the issues and find ways to bring broad discussions to the table where we all intervene and add value in the search of solutions. Thank you. Elma? Yes, uh, just a few comments. Uh, what uh, Susan said right now, uh, I, I also share in the same on education because uh, uh, I strongly believe, and it's also part of uh, the uh, state policy in my country, that the best investments which you can make is investments in education. Because by all means, education uh, its one of the uh, pillars of the sustainable development of the state, and uh, this is absolutely a must for every, uh, for any, of every country or any ruler. Uh, with regard to these uh, very emotional statements on terrorism and Western Africa and uh, coastal areas, I, I just want to make, uh, just re, uh, return back to what I said uh, in my initial remark. Uh, what I said about the United Nations Security Council adoption of resolution, which started implementing it before of its adoption, I also got uh, uh, Libya in mind because uh, whenever the attacking on Libya was started, uh, the resolution was still under the table of the Security Council. And uh, at, that kind, at that time also, uh, we was uh, uh, very much interested to be a, a member of Security Council and I know it from the first hand. 
So my point is that uh, with uh, sometimes this is uh, what we need to do. Uh, it needs more analysis uh, before then uh, you are entering the process because you can ruin the very fragile balance which uh, you already, which exists uh, in uh, in the uh, from the point of security in the area. And uh, that's probably one of uh, the responses, uh, what we are believe, that uh, uh, what Security Council needs to very strongly considering uh, the, its own uh, decisions and resolutions. Thank you. NASA, do you have some comment on education? Uh, yes. You see, uh, the, the, uh, our work at the UN Alliance of Civilization focused on four pillars. Number one is education. Uh, beside youth, media, and migration, I think education is the key if we want to, to prevent uh, violent and diffuse tension through culture, through religion, uh, we should focus more in, uh, in education. Uh, otherwise, the young people will be easy target for extremist groups, uh, uh, to uh, engage them in, uh, in, in the, on causing problems. Thank you. Thank you. Terry? Thirty seconds uh, on Africa. Uh, Secretary General was at the peacekeeping conference in, uh, at uh, the UN, uh, sponsored by the UN and President uh, Obama. He offered on behalf of NATO several tools uh, for peacekeeping uh, to the UN that I have been discussing with UN uh, colleagues to take forward. These same tools are offered to the African Union as well. There are things that we are doing with the African Union to help, and we are open to doing more. It depends on the African Union. Uh, on Mauritania, we have a partnership with Mauritania. I have been to Nouakchott. I had the privilege of meeting your Prime Minister and your Ministers of Foreign Affairs and Defense. Uh, there are several things that we are doing. Again, we are open to see what more we can do to help, especially on counterterrorism that you mentioned. Thank you. Manuel, um, close very, us out. Very brief. In real estate, they, they say it's all about location, location, location. For states, it's all about education, education, education. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 10-minute uh, break now, but please join me in thanking uh, the panel for some very interesting remarks. <laughs>